Uh, is an attempt to define the standard for how content from the Internet is filtered for mobile communications. WAP was developed because content is now readily available on the Internet, and there needs to be a way of making it easily available to mobile terminals. One of the reasons why the mobile industry has gotten so excited about WAP is because it combines two of the fastest growing industries, wireless and the Internet. The wireless application protocol incorporates a relatively simple micro-browser into the mobile phone. As such, WAP's requirement for only limited resources on the mobile phone makes it suitable for thin clients and early smartphones. Wireless application protocol is designed to add value-added services by putting the intelligence in the WAP servers whilst adding just a microbrowser to the mobile phones themselves. Microbrowser-based services and applications reside temporarily on servers, not permanently in the phone. The wireless application protocol is aimed at turning a mass market mobile phone into a network-based smartphone. The emergence of these standards is driving the development of the technology that can be a boon to countries and areas where traditional cable network infrastructure is lagging behind the technology. Internet access can now be made available to the most remote regions of the world through the use of the global roaming capabilities that are available with new digital wireless technology. As a result of the standards development referenced earlier, mobile Internet access is becoming a reality. Web access, email, faxes, short messaging, and access to enterprise computing resources are or soon will be available through wireless service providers around the world. One of the key pieces of equipment that will soon appear in ears all around the world will be the web-enabled phones. Motorola, Ericsson, and Nokia lead the way in delivery of web-enabled phones. Ericsson in particular leads the way with its recent purchase of Qualcomm CDMA phone producing division. These phones will be relatively inexpensive since the money will be made in network access charges and are offered, offered in special promotions and range from fifty to seventy five dollars. For more information you may visit the website www.cdg.org. Another device that will be used more in conjunction with mobile phones is the palm top computer. They are smaller and lighter than laptops, measuring about seven by five by one and a half inches and weighing one to two pounds. They currently cost between two hundred and eight hundred dollars in the United States. They operate using a smaller version of Windows known as Windows CE or a web browser and come with an internal modem word processing, spreadsheet, and personal information management applications. Some of these applications are offered by Palm Top Software and include route planners, dictionaries in multiple languages, and personal financial management software. Check http www.palmtop.nl/index.htm for more information. I should also mention another wireless device that is being developed, namely pager-sized wireless devices. They will provide short messaging service up to 160 characters and, be, and can be integrated with email for both voice and electronic paging. Wireless services are also appearing that will make all sorts of useful information available to a person who is connected. For example, there are several technologies that provide assistance in locating facilities. According to an article in a recent issue of The Economist, Airflash, a Silicon Valley firm, has developed algorithms that find the closest hotel or cinema to a user's cell phone, taking into account geographical barriers such as rivers and, in the future, traffic conditions. Another firm, Vicinity, is planning to use this database of more than four million physical businesses, which already helps web surfers find the nearest Levi's store or FedEx drop-off point, 
to allow retailers to transmit discount coupons to the cell phone of a consumer who happens to walk by in an attempt to lure them into the store. Oracle, Mobile.com, and Strategy.com, both subsidiaries of the major database supplier, Oracle, along with MicroStrategy, a data warehousing firm, allow users to select information that they want to receive from their corporate websites using the WAP standard. Alert notification is also provided. If a flight is arriving late or if the shares of a company uh, stock drop below a certain level, alerts are automatically sent out to the mobile user. This is only the tip of the iceberg for what is being developed. Perhaps someday the ITC will offer a seminar totally devoted to wireless developments. Convergence isn't coming, it's already here. Multimedia has exploded onto the net and has had a major impact on all areas of communication. This multimedia explosion has been a catalyst in accelerating the movement started by the World Wide Web to provide electronic marketing, advertising, and selling as well as support for online transactions in a true electronic commerce environment. Users can browse catalogs and view products of interest in the form of electronic shopping malls. With the advent of more powerful home computer systems, users can bring these services into the home through powerful new telephone and cable delivery systems, which are currently being deployed. These systems will give the end user the bandwidth necessary to participate in this enriched environment. Several new technologies are on the horizon that will change our way of communicating and doing business. One of these is the use of voice over IP to provide internet phone service. Long distance companies are scrambling to deal with this new phenomenon of voice over IP. In essence, using the internet as a phone service as well as a data service is well underway. For example, Cisco Systems has a voice over IP strategy and has begun to implement it into their routing and switching equipment. Cisco IP telephones are the next generation intelligent communication devices delivering the essential business communications at a touch. Fully programmable, the growing family of Cisco IP telephones provides the most frequently used business features. Each Cisco IP telephone provides toll quality audio and doesn't require a companion PC. Because it is an IP-based telephone, it can be installed anywhere on a corporate local area or wide area IP network. Audio and video streaming technologies are also having a profound effect. Companies such as mp3.com are revolutionizing the music business by using audio streaming technology to transmit records to consumers and audio files everywhere. Video streaming is changing the way we work and even relax. One can view the latest movies or participate in a conference without actually having to travel. Much the same way that you folks are doing today, but right from their desktops. Recently, I was even able to view a live surgery online via the Infometics connection with eMedia.com. In addition, many United States broadcast TV networks are providing an internet-based simulcast and are using the net to interact with their viewers. Desktop video teleconferencing, or DVTC, using the internet is also growing in popularity and quality. DVTC can be used to provide audio and video communication between desktops around the world and will greatly enhance opportunities for long-distance learning and collaboration. Of course, use of this technology requires enhancing our desktop computers with mini cameras and sound cards and the procurement of higher bandwidth transmission capability. But for those that can afford it, the benefits are enormous. For example, doctors will soon be able to view live surgeries online and receive continuous medical training transmitted right to their desktop in their home or office. DentalExchange.com, a website catering to dentists, offers a myriad of such online continuing education courses. 
to see free demonstrations of the power of this technology, one may access eMedia.com. Multimedia website applications, voice, video, and data with 3D graphics are being developed to provide the capability to take online tours of countries or facilities. This immersion into virtual reality is being fueled by and is being extended by developments in virtual reality markup language, Java 3D, and other emerging software technologies. Let us turn our attention now away from infrastructure and into the world of Internet software. The usefulness of the Internet in the global village is accelerating rapidly with the introduction of even more software languages, tools, and applications. One of the most important emerging software developments is Extensible Markup Language, or XML. Leslie Nicholson of Knight Rider News Services reported in an article written for the San Diego Union Tribune's Computer Link magazine about how XML will transform the World Wide Web as we know it today. He quotes Steve Ballmer, president of Microsoft, as saying that XML is the secret sauce of the Internet. Mr. Nicholson goes on to explain that XML and its more familiar cousin HTML are markup languages, sets of codes that instruct a computer on how to handle a text file. Hypertext markup language, HTML, tells a computer how information should be displayed on a computer screen or how it should be formatted for printing. It also governs a link between websites. XML goes a step beyond HTML. It allows users to create tags that provide background information about the text, not just how a word looks, but what it represents. Thus, XML is meant to help machines share, store, and reuse data. HTML is meant to help humans read data. In essence, XML is a quantum leap in web technology. It will greatly facilitate enterprise-to-enterprise -enterprise communication and commerce, and will bring more structure to the web. For more information on XML, one can visit XML.org, which is an industry web portal operated by the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards, also known as OASIS. OASIS is funded by a group of companies committed to establishing an open, distributed system for enabling the use of XML in electronic commerce and other industrial applications. Java programming language is designed to meet the challenges of application development in the context of heterogeneous network-wide distributed environments. Java is both a programming language and a machine-independent platform that is designed to be ubiquitous, just as the Internet is ubiquitous. I won't go deeper into the technical details here, but Java is more important as it greatly facilitates the development of effective web applications such as e-business and e-commerce. It should be noted that companies such as Sun Microsystems are now providing linkage between Java and XML, which will accelerate Internet application development even more. More information regarding the technical details of Java can be found by visiting the following URL, which is java.sun.com. The Virtual Reality Markup Language, VRML, is a standard language for describing interactive 3D objects and worlds delivered across the Internet. VRML worlds can be interactive and animated and it can include embedded hyperlinks to other web documents. VRML isn't a general purpose programming language like C++. It isn't a script language like JavaScript or page specification language like HTML. It's a scene description language that describes the geometry and behavior of a 3D scene or world. VRML and other three-dimensional programming languages such as Web 3D and Java 3D provide the ability for the creator to immerse the user into a specific online environment. For example, 
one can take a complete facility tour of a tourist resort online to determine if he or she wishes to visit in person or not. The applications for 3D online are infinite. To view some interesting examples of VRML-based Web 3D technology, one can visit the National Center for Supercomputing, that's NCSA, homepage at ncsa.uiuc.edu. The convergence of media, higher speed, more powerful servers, and available software is creating an empowering environment that is spawning new applications on the Internet at an incredible pace. For example, NASDAQ is going global. As reported in The Economist, NASDAQ is in the process of creating the first global digital stock market. As part of its deal with London and Frankfurt Stock Exchanges, the new entity will create a joint venture under the NASDAQ brand name. Similar ventures are also being launched with Hong Kong, Sydney, and NASDAQ Canada. Trading will be conducted 24 hours a day across all of these different markets. Large global companies are building corporate intranets that use internet technology in a virtually private way. This approach facilitates information sharing and reduces cost. One example is Science Applications International Corporation. The company manages a $5 billion global enterprise using its own slice of the Internet known as SAICnet. SAIC employs anywhere in the world can tap into databases containing resumes, project descriptions, company qualification information, and other information needed to put together successful proposals. Large global companies are using the Internet for building close associations with their business partners that are called extranets. For example, Tech Data Corporation, a $7 billion distributor, makes its 60,000 plus warehouse units available for pricing and shipping online with all of its value added resellers worldwide. Thus, companies such as my company, Virtual Integrators, could check price and availability as well as order and issue purchase orders without touching any paper. It is all done electronically using the web. All of this is now creating a kind of company known as a virtual enterprise. The employees and or related consultants can be located anywhere in the world and communicate effectively over the net using desktop video conferencing and email. Thus, the employees can work together even though they are not co-located at an office. At Virtual Integrators, our employees can work on projects anywhere in the world and report time and status for any project using our time track system. In addition, I can view this information from anywhere in the world. Thus, even a small company like Virtual Integrators can be empowered to operate internationally. During this presentation, I have touched on many of the fantastic benefits and opportunities available in cyberspace. However, they can come at a price. Who would have ever imagined that a computer virus named the love bug could spread around the world within hours and infect or otherwise have an impact on millions of users worldwide. The incident even made the cover of Time magazine. Well, not the main subject of this seminar, it is important to keep in mind the four key ingredients to successful, safe, and secure participation in Internet applications. When working with a provider or an enterprise with your application, whether it be video conferencing, e-commerce, e-business, or long-distance collaboration and information sharing, please make sure that they are taking steps to prevent the virus transmission, block unauthorized users, protect data privacy and integrity. Also make sure that they are set up to restore service in the event of a major disaster. This topic is so important that the ITC will conduct a future seminar regarding asset protection on the Internet. We have covered quite a bit of material today. Let us summarize. Far greater data transmission speeds will soon be widely available and will allow for much greater diversity in applications. We will see a convergence of media technologies such as broadcast television, cable television, satellite networks, 
public switch phone services and wireless services. This media explosion and bandwidth increase will provide for an increased rate in the release of new products and services available over the Internet. More cost-effective and user-friendly devices will be made available at lower costs, enabling millions more users to go online in cyberspace. In closing, I would hope that you will be able to use the information provided today as a stimulus to expand your institution's participation in our global electronic village. Let us use this technology for enhancing our societies and improving world relations as we march ahead into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, let us begin the first question and answer session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that only one question be asked per phone call and that these questions be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax which appear on your screen. We will remind you to make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Questions from Okay, we have a question from Santo Domingo. Please go ahead. Our question is, from your perspective, for underdeveloped countries, what is more profitable uh, as far as wireless technology, CDMA or C GSM, and which one is more functional on a medium term? <coughs> Uh, that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, I think there's two ways to look at that. Uh, GSM is more mature in its implementation. It's already operating in uh, many countries worldwide. I think the profitability aspect, you want to think about optimizing the bandwidth provided uh, via the technology. And CDMA holds the most promise for providing a lot more capacity uh, in the uh, digital wireless space. So the best way to look at it for long-term planning would be to start to look at CDMA. I believe also that there are some efforts underway to try to merge these two standards. Uh, they haven't made a lot of progress yet, but it's something also to track. So in the future, if you start from the CDA, CDMA side, I think you'll also wind up with some compatibility with the GSM side. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Lima, Peru. Lima, please go ahead. Thank you. I would like to know what the impact is in the current structure of the companies as far as investment and information. So what would be the cost? Well, <coughs> I guess... Uh, I guess I'll take that one also. Uh, the best, it's very difficult to just say what would be the cost. It's almost like saying how much uh, do you want to pay for a car? The way to look at that is what is it that you want the car to do? Uh, if you're interested in racing the car, that's one type of, of machine. If you're interested in hauling big loads of freight, that's a different kind of car. Same thing really holds true for the information technology. You really need to start in terms of your cost impact or cost benefit analysis with what do you, you expect the technology to do for your enterprise. Then from there, you can compare the cost between the various ways of implementing you know, the goals of your organization. So it's very important, really, to start with the enterprise level view, uh, the strategic goals of your organization, and the business processes that you want to enhance via uh, the technology. Thank you. Uh, our next caller is from Sinaloa. Please go ahead. Buenos dias. 
from the web pages that we have right now from the ACM, only 7% are educational pages. And then you have to um, uh, take into account the sources, the language, the truthfulness of its content. What projects are being currently designed for the in by Internic and the same, the other prov uh, software providers like Microsoft and Cisco and Motorola and all these HP com uh, companies in order to offer greater brand, uh, bandwidth because in the end that's where people are going to be able to grow culturally and benefit all the countries. So what is being done in terms of regulations of all these things? Greater bandwidth or regulation? Okay. Uh, I think that you're, you, you brought up a very important point. One of the serious drawbacks, of course, is that there's been all this entrepreneurial development in the United States, but not a lot of it has been focused on the educational community. I think that a, a lot more of these companies uh, are just starting to realize that for true global international commerce, uh, that they need to start uh, looking toward companies such as uh, Integra.com, which has just recently been formulated, to uh, start to provide this uh, competency training and uh, education online and courseware development so that we can then uh, move toward this global village and then from that education then the people can take that forward in their own country and implement the technologies and uh, of, of interest via the web. But I think it's a very, very important point that um, there's a gap still in terms of, of web applications uh, for educational purposes that will help <clears throat> provide the training necessary to uh, really uh, give this a jump start in each one of those countries. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, Alicante, Spain, uh, has the next question. Please go ahead. Good morning. I would like to know who control the satellites, the GSM, because we will be depending upon them in order to be able to work comfortably on the Internet environment, on the Internet in general. Thank you. Is there any central organization that controls sat satellites, or is it a decentralized organization? Well, I can maybe answer to that question. Uh, there is not a centralized in the sense, I believe, the uh, esteemed uh, question, uh, questioner actually asked. Uh, there, at, in the world, there are, of course, international bodies who coordinate uh, some activities of the satellite, especially with the frequencies and also uh, footprints and so forth. But uh, there is not a single world body organization for this kind of uh, censorship or coordination. But on the local level, definitely there are because then you have the association of the satellite, the one, the manufacturer, of course, has nothing to do with this one, but when you are uplinking the program, the same coordination that normally you have with the television uh, setup, you have it with the satellites. Well, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Paraguay, uh, Universidad Americana Asuncion. Please go ahead. A greeting to all of you from the American University in Paraguay. The question is about the routing IP. I understand there are 120 bits, two blocks of eight bits, and expressed in hexadecimal. Then there are eight blocks of 16 bits. Why did you say that you were based on the IP domicile of six fields. Thank you. There was a lot of interference of sound. They were very, I don't know if I conveyed the numbers adequately. I am sorry. Well, it's a question about the standards. Are the standards? Right. Uh... Yes. Uh, I believe the question was about why uh, we're moving toward a six field IP address uh, format for Internet. Uh, packet transmission. The reason is that the, we're basically running out of addresses. Uh, the current uh, standard is a four-field address. Uh, many of you may have seen them if you 
Uh, when you enter a, a URL, that's really known as a domain name. But what that generates in cyberspace is a four-field address, which actually then uh, directs you to the web page or the, <clears throat> or the person you're trying to email to. The six fields are needed because we're having capacity problems. As more and more people get on the Internet, we're going to need more and more addresses in cyberspace. And in recognizing this, the National Science Foundation put together a committee that is working on building the, uh, a new <clears throat> IP protocol based on the six field addressing. What this will cause is that all of the manufacturers of IP equipment, such as Cisco Systems, will need to reprogram their software to support the six field address uh, so that we can then uh, b bring millions more people into the global village.